So I'm Wendy Hughes, I'm from the Four International. We're talking, just to be clear, we're talking about foreign languages, not programming languages in here. I had some interesting conversations earlier. So first off, I'd like to get a, a little idea of, you know, you yell up from the back. Is there anything in particular that you'd like me to cover today? Like global selling. Like, for, for me, for example, so I have a website, and the translation is probably the biggest part. My calculator is all there and stuff like that, so I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. Okay, so on global selling, because you've got something that could easily be Correct. distributed internationally. And I'm getting hits from those countries, but I mean, maybe they just don't understand what the heck's going on. Okay, okay, to help the countries understand. Yeah. Um, I want to learn more about what, if there's any translation connector services to WordPress. So, uh, for example, we have a translation service. Um, is there ways to sort of automate that process so that translation services? Okay, so kind of technology plugins or APIs or how do you streamline the process of it to the translation company you have. Okay, yeah. Does the translation also can work with uh, my situation, for example, with selling, if I'm selling in China, will it translate to different uh, currencies and so on? Different language. Currencies? Yes. Okay, so translation that might translate into different currencies. Okay, automatically or? However, that would have to be done. Okay. Is it uh, hoping to cover multiple options to multiple kinds of customers? So customers that could afford full two-way non-trip translation with an agency that customers have no budget, they're a small nonprofit, and still want to build a service their community that has constituents in multiple languages. Okay, that's a really good question. Is, is if you have customers that have different budgets, how is it the accessibility to, what are the options for the different translation you could do so they could, could have it? Yes? Um, similarly, are, other than WPML, is there other like, ways to, or the plugins, other ways to sort of actually implement translation on this? I don't know if you're going to even push that. Is that something you can think about? Yeah, yeah. So other than WPML, um, what are some other plugins that might work with WordPress? Have you had problems with WPML? No, no, I was, is that what you generally, is that, I don't know if that's your go-to, that's mine, but I don't know. Okay, so I'll talk about that. Anybody else? Okay, all right, so that's really helpful. I'll try to make sure I go in a little bit, bit deeper. And luckily, all those topics are part of my presentation, so I'll try to go a little bit deeper and um, answer those questions. All right. So the world today, let's look at a couple of things that are changing in the world. About 20 years ago, um, only 10% of the U.S. population had passports. That number is up to about 40%. Um, and uh, the, the people in, the, in England and Wales, it's about 78% of the people that have passports. Okay, so to me, that's a huge change. And, and one of it's kind of political is um, you used to not need a passport to go into Canada or Mexico, and that changed a number of years ago. But the other thing that's happening is that travel is becoming a lot more accessible. We have the whole millennial generation that's coming in and saying, I want experiences rather than things, and they are leading the way with travel, with uh, exchange programs that they're doing, with you know, traveling around the world, the Airbnbs, um, and so that's bringing a whole generation of people along that aren't afraid of language and culture um, that has historically been part of the United States. Now, you know, maybe it's going on a little bit today, too, but we're still seeing waves of change that that's happening. Um, and that's meaning that businesses are going a lot more um, international because people aren't afraid of it so much. The other thing that's happening is you've got something called the accidental export, which you might be experiencing right here, is that I take a website, I put it up, I've got something that's demanded internationally, and then all of a sudden, I've got a bunch of people from a country that is buying from me. And I can see it on my, my statistics and my analytics, um, and I don't quite know why it's happening, but I can see it now, huh, 
If I were to translate my website into that language, would that make a difference? And then if you do, you do see a difference. So accidental exporter is something that's been coming up um, more and more in companies that aren't afraid and are looking at growing their revenue stream are starting to pay attention to that. And it's not just in the global marketplace that's happening, it's happening here in the US. So, have you all heard of the melting pot? Raise your hand if you've heard of the melting pot. Okay, so that is the old fashioned term of that when immigrants came in, they tried to push away their culture and language and assimilate into the US. That's changed over the last number of years. Now people are coming in and they're saying, I'm proud of my heritage and I want my kids to learn my language and I want to keep it up and I'm going to keep my community. So rather than the melting pot, there's been more of a talk of, the, you know, now with the crunchy salad, you've got to have a lot of different things in there because that adds a lot of flavor and a lot of fun. And if you just think about the number of foods and the number of words that are added into uh, the American language, you can see that, that that has happened a long, but it's still happening now. Um, and the other thing is in the United States, with people keeping their languages, let's look at just Spanish alone. That is the second largest Spanish-speaking market in the world is here in the US. So just think about that a minute. If you want to export to another company that has a Spanish-speaking market, Mexico is the only other largest market. You can still use your same distribution and mailing and communication systems that you're using here in the United States to target Spanish speakers. And the Spanish speakers here in the US have, uh, they're estimating about a $1.3 trillion spending power because the people that are coming in are having children, they're going to the school systems, they're getting into college, they're getting professional jobs, they're still speaking Spanish, they're still watching Spanish TV at home. Um, and they're starting to buy. So the smart marketers are all advertising on Telemundo. So I was just looking up um, which ones are current. When the Olympics are on, I always switch back and forth between the two, two channels, the Telemundo and, or Univision, whoever has the, and whichever <coughs> station is showing the US Olympics, because I like to see the advertisers that are on that. So it's a Comcast, Telemundo's a Comcast station, but Bios advertises on it, and then you've got Procter & Gamble, McDonald's, Jack in the Box, Taco Bell, IHOP, VW, Toyota, Pepsi Coke, OxyClina, Gorilla Glue. Now that's a new one, but that's a new one that's on there. So are they Spanish companies? Are they all U.S. companies targeting people in the U.S.? So even if you're not going internationally, another consideration is just to look here in the U.S. Here in Massachusetts, out where I live in Metro West, um, there's a huge Brazilian population, so the companies that are even putting, you know, whoops, excuse me, uh, putting a Brazilian flag in their window or doing minimal translation or showing that they're opening arms to, to bring in new customers. All right, so not only is our culture changing, but so is the internet. This has changed um, the world. So if you figure out of the world's population, about 3.5 billion people have access to the internet. All right, so about a third of those are English speakers. So that makes me think, well, why bother translating or why bother targeting other languages if people speak English, right? But only 5% of those billion people actually are native speaking uh, English speakers. So 5% of that really narrows it down. You go, well, if the other people aren't native speakers, maybe they'll still buy. Well, let's look at it. 90% um, of the people would rather visit sites in their native language. Okay, so if they have the option, they're going to do that. They're going to spend most of the time there, and you can actually um, you see down in the yellow, they'll pay more for products that are done in their native language. 
So speaking of accessibility, you know, my focus is on accessibility for languages, but at uh, lunch today I was talking to some other people about accessibility, and this is probably a very poor slide if you are colorblind. So <laughs> I apologize for that, and I will give you a hard copy or put the statistics up if you want it another way. So people are really looking for information in their native language. All right, so let's talk about uh, you know, more of the numbers. So Google is our search engine here, our predominant search engines. And about 50% of the searches are done outside of the U.S. So if you look at the search volume and you bring it down, it's 5.5 billion searches per day. And if you figure um, a fraction of those are English speakers, it starts opening up what the potential is for going into other languages. Um, and plus, I'm not even getting into today of um, uh, I guess it wasn't important. That's why I wasn't getting into it today. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. So cautionary tales. What do you want to be aware of when you start doing this? First off, um, people are usually afraid of doing it. Now, hats off to most of you in this room. You're probably not afraid of it. That's why you're here. But there are some, some stories that we've heard that um, you can run into. Maybe, some, maybe you've heard some of them. So the first one is this. This actually happened with a client of ours. Um, the, the ass part of the brain. He... Um, owns a toy manufacturer, and I'm going to go into this a little bit more detail in a minute. He owns a toy company, and one of his toys started flying off the shelves, and he couldn't keep up with it. And so he decided that he had to figure out what was going on, and he found out that there was some research done on this particular toy in Japan that was making the toy fly off the shelf. And he wanted to know what it was, because the Japanese people were ordering it from the US because he could have it, because they were all sold out over there. So um, when he used machine translation, he found that it was the ass part of the brain that was being translated. It didn't help him at all. <laughs> so he had to come to us. All right, here's another one that was um, poorly translated. Do you remember this campaign with the, you know, got milk with all the milk, the milk mustaches? Remember that? So uh, this is the this is Serena Williams and her sister um, years ago when they were advertising it, and they they said, oh, this went so well, let's translate it and launch it out in California and put it all over the billboards and try to sell more milk out there. Well, whoever translated it did a literal translation. Do you speak Spanish? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you speak Spanish? Yeah. yeah, okay. Somebody else back there is laughing. So, I leche actually means, are you lactating? <laughs> so, you know, taking a word for word translation, so you've got the machine translation, then you have an example here of somebody who did, this was before machine translation, so they didn't understand. Spanish well enough to know that if you, you've got to get the meaning behind it too. Um, all right, now Serena Williams, there was an article about her in Glamour, and I just wanted to show you what a powerful, beautiful woman she is now, so from before and after, that was just a side note. Okay, here's another one I just learned about last week. So do you know the company, the, the Gentle Giant Moving Company? So I met the owner, and he said he went over to China, and there was this guy there that was doing t-shirts, and you could have anything written on it that you want. And he said, oh, great, you know, I'll have my company name written on there. <laughs> so he said, can you put Gentle Giant? So the guy's big. I mean, he's a gentle giant. He moves your stuff. You're very, if you need a moving company, I'd highly recommend it, because I can see how he really cares about his customers. He had this put, in, put on, and he says he's walking around China, and people are just laughing at him. They're just, you know, pointing and laughing. So he finally goes back to the hotel where somebody was bilingual, and he says, can you tell me what this says? And, he said, and, they, and they said, yes, it means large homosexual man. 
So our learning from this is sometimes people, trained translators, interpreters know to ask for clarification if they don't know what it means. This person didn't know what it meant, and anything that referred to gentle in China means homosexual. So he thought, okay, I'll just put it on, rather than asking the question, wait, what are you trying to get across here? So mistakes can happen, and you want to be very careful about who you're choosing to do your translation. All right, so that brings us into translation. And I want to define some terms for you so you have a clearer understanding. So translation refers to written. Interpretation is spoken. The words are used interchangeably, and if you listen to the news, they'll often say the, the, the president's translator said, and it's like nails on a chalkboard to me because they don't know. Anybody in our industry will ask them, you know, what are you trying to get, or, you know, we can say the word and they'll know what we mean. Globalization versus localization. Globalization is good for like a manufacturing company, a technology company, something um, that you want to use. One Spanish that can talk to more of the world. Localization means you're actually bringing it down into the currency for the location. You're making local references, you're, lo you're using um, local slang, that your visuals all have to do with something. So if you even think of us, and California um, were very different. This does take a person to do. There's no way to automate uh, the currency exchanges. If you want it localized, you have to have someone do it. Um, and if you're selling any consumer products, you want to make sure that it, it's localized so it's really talking to the people that are going to buy. Multilingual chat. Um, if you have a chat bot, it's very easy to do translation and then um, have that load through the bot. Um, we are actually are starting to offer a, a service where you can get people who are bilingual trained on your service that can work behind the scenes. So if this, you know, this is typically larger companies that want to have it would be like a call service that somebody can do do the chat behind the scenes and, and answer the questions. So that's a whole area that we see is going to explode. Uh, and then telephone interpreting is when you get somebody who's on the phone. So video and telephone interpreting are starting to become more popular. Um, okay, so you're thinking about translation. And you're thinking about all these areas to go. There's a lot of different components that go into it. And as with, with anything that you're starting, what you want to do is look at your corporate objectives or your client's project objectives, and you say, what is it that we're trying to do? Then you find your communication strategy, and then you start working on your multilingual strategy. So these are the moving parts that can go around for it. So for example, is that Lisa back there? Yes. Yes, okay. So she's at the Cape Cod Children's Museum. We were talking earlier. They get a lot of the international visitors that come into the Cape, and the Children's Museum would be a perfect place to go. Now, they have a website. They're a nonprofit, not a huge budget. But their goal is to service. I'm going to use you as a, as a live case study right here. They've got a lot of people, potential customers, that could come in. And so their strategy would be to explain that it's a children's museum, um, how they can plan their visit, what the hours are, who it's appropriate for. Technology, it's not a high-tech involvement here because it's just a website. So in their WordPress website, they can put up another page with the language. Um, the process, they can send it out, get it back, and they can probably load it themselves. But they have to have good quality. They're not going to put a Google Translate widget in because um, they're really trying to pull people in. Don't need a lot of localization because people know that when they're, they're coming in here, um, they can read a general thing. It's not highly technical and it's going to be gathering people here. So then they have to think about, you know, is there any employers? Is there local customers that they want to get? What languages do they want to target? So that's the green circle. Um, and then, you know, the other thing, do they need spoken interpretation there? Probably not. Are they going to need telephone interpreting? Probably not. So, they, so you can see the things they can start 
are exiting out. And you can see the process that you go through to start thinking about the translation. Now, then that brings us to languages. What languages do you want? Um, you can start, like I talked about earlier, where the company saw from their analytics on their website that a lot of people were coming in from Germany. So they start out with a landing page, and they put it into German. Um, or there was another company that we work with that only sold certain paint products in, in um, certain countries. So then they would only do those products in those countries. So that's all part of developing your strategy. And what is nice sometimes if you're just getting into it is to start with one language, figure out what the strategy is, and then you can easily duplicate it on um, there. All right, so let's look at some case studies. So O-Toys, same thing. It's a, it's a same thing as the Cape Cod Children's Museum. They um, had a specific goal in mind. They wanted to figure out what, what it was talking about that was making sales skyrocket. They wanted to put that information in English. So when he first came to me, it was before he Googled it, and he says, Wendy, I finally got a job for you. He's somebody that I've known in business for years. He said, I never thought I would, but I want to translate this website because I want to see what they're saying about us to make us go. So I go to the website, and I'm thinking, cool, you know, this will be a nice job. If I open it up, it's pages long. It's got tons of information on it. It's talking about tons of toys. I'm like, woo, this is a big project for us. But in reality, he didn't, he didn't want all that information. He wanted something. So I, I told him, I said, Ken, go back, flip it through Google Translate, figure out what you want to know, and if that gives an answer to you. Probably smart, you know, not so smart from a business standpoint, but it got him what he needed. He came back and he showed me the ass part of the brain. I'm like, I don't know what part of the brain that is. Let's figure that out. So we took the copy that he wanted. We gave it to a professional translator, and they were able to come back and give him what he wanted, and then he could go off and, um, and use that in his English marketing. So it ended up being a huge project narrowed down to a small one. Now let's look at this company. Opposite side of the scale. Okay, they sell packaging products around the world. Um, Conatech Sunoco was made up of a lot of acquisitions. They have company leaders in the different countries that know the languages, they have requirements. They've got some products that are sold in some countries, some products that weren't sold in, so they had to, to line that up. The Excel spreadsheet of what needed to be translated had to be very detailed because um, it showed the page, it showed the country, and therefore the language, and then it showed which products would be there. And so with the plugin, um, we were able to uh, pull just the pages in that needed to be translated and put that information back. And now they also, um, if you think back to the circle, they had employees that wanted to proof the material because if they had particular words that were used in the country, um, they wanted to make sure that it was used accurately. So if you look at strategy, they had to have multiple languages for certain products and they, have, they wanted to have a global website that would apply. Now they could globalize a lot of this because it's packaging, it, it, it didn't need to be localized. So if you looked at technology, to manually take it out of the website, translate it, and put it back would be very difficult. So we did use a plugin, which I am going to talk about a little bit more. Um, so we could pull it out, translate it, do a live translation, and then push it back in. For process, rather than just pulling it out and pushing it back up into the website, they wanted to have a review, so we had to make sure that it went out to the people who were actually reviewing it. Um, if there were any questions, like I'm thinking of the Spanish came back and there were two words that they had a preference for use, then we could go back and change those, update those, um, put it throughout the Spanish, and then, um, then it was approved and we could push it back up. Um, we don't 
develop many websites. So we work with designers and developers that are building that up, but we work with them to think through, you know, if there are H rep lang tags, if there's country tags on it, how those extra pages would be set up. Um, and so it can be a comprehensive and, and working website. Um, and then quality. So you think strategy, process, technology, and quality. Their quality had to be very good because they're selling online and customers are coming to them to learn the information. So it wasn't as easy as a Google plugin. Okay, here's another one. The Medical Foundation, which is a division of health resources in action. This is a company that's based here in Boston and they do medical communications. So they wanted to get their website done on cer certain uh, topics that were, I think it was in two languages, I'm pretty sure it was Spanish and uh, Portuguese, that communicated these um, healthy living to, the, to, to people in Massachusetts. Yeah, they distribute through, Ma no, they actually they distribute throughout the United States, but this one was just for Massachusetts. And they were blogging um, twice a month, and they wanted the blogs to go. So what we did was develop a, a plugin, and then they, every time the blogs came in, they came in, and then we'd automatically pu publish them out. So you can see there's all different sizes and scopes and needs for the different ones. Okay, so let me pause here and talk about the plugins. We, for WordPress websites, do use WPML. It's the one that's been around the longest. It's the one we figured it out. We think it has a, it's very streamlined to pull the information out and pull back in. Um, there's a couple other ones that you can use. Um, I'm not as familiar with them, but I, you know, I'm sure if somebody had a strong feeling that they wanted to use them. I think ProLang is one, which I learned about today. Um, and there's a couple others. There's another one that it's a, um, a SaaS payment model. So you as the client would have to pay, you know, or, or provider your client would have to pay monthly to make sure that works. And so it depends um, on who wants to have control of that as to which one they use. But for, for WordPress, we use W. Um, PML for um, HubSpot, we have a different one, um, and those are the two areas that we're working in primarily. Okay, so translation for WordPress, the old way, this was a few years ago, um, this is a very detailed slide and I took it from a written thing, but I wanted to show you to just make a, a point. Um, a few years ago, we were looking at all the steps that it would take for somebody to, to translate a WordPress website. You know, and, and I want to take a pause here. If you're taking pictures of the slides, if you want to give me your information afterwards, I'll share the presentation with you so you can have that off. Um, so when we looked at the current process for somebody, if you have a WordPress website and then you decide you wanted to get it translated, so you send the Word doc or the copy off for translation and you get it back and you send it. It was 21 steps when I actually plotted it out. Um, with the connectors, there you can boil it down to four steps. Um, so technology in the industry has gotten a lot better about doing, and I, this was, I think this was three years ago. Um, so technology in the industry has dramatically changed over the last three to five years. That I see as uh, delivery has gotten a lot better. Um, as for technology for machine translation and AI, uh, when Google, for, I've owned this company for 15 years, it's been in existence for 30 years. When Google Translate first came out, we said, um, that, you know, oh my gosh, this is going to put us out of business, and the industry kind of went through a shakeup. What it did was actually increase the amount of demand for it. Now AI is coming out, and, there, and again, I'm seeing the same thing, which is that it's increasing um, the demand for it. 
but it's really streamlining the process of how to get it done. All right, so my, my suggestions for how to do this. Um, there are appropriate uses for machine, and AI, uh, machine translation and AI. And um, TripAdvisor, I was talking to the person that runs their localization department, and they're using it a lot because they have so much information coming in from their users that they're building that communication style. So they're really like, you know, Google's doing a lot on this to try to, to get into the machine translation. Um, but they also have, uh, TripAdvisor has particular ways to write their English so that the machine can recognize the translation and be a perfect match. Um, so the internal training comes before it's actually going through translation. So I just talked about how TripAdvisor writes their English. We also work with people on how to write global English, on how it's easier to be translated. You give us a poorly written English document, that's going to be very hard to translate because we're not going to know what the meanings are coming across. So clear and concise language always helps. Um, and then, you know, my favorite is in the U.S. A lot of CEOs will, will get up and they say, you know, this year, this is the year, we're going to hit a home run. Well, if you're communicating to other people in the, the world, they don't know what a home run is. You know, they might be using cricket references. So sports, jokes, politics, anything like that, you want to be very careful of um, when you're writing about it. If you go from one language to another language, it takes more space. So for example, Farfagnugan is one word in German. It's four words, the pleasure of driving in English. So anytime you're designing a website, make sure that you're allowing extra space if it's going to be translated. Uh, agencies are starting to use something called translation memory, which means that when we've translated one paragraph for your website and now you want to put it on an old-fashioned brochure, once that's been translated, you can reuse that saves time, money, but more importantly, it keeps your, um, your voice consistent in marketing. And then the big one we run into is unless the original is in final copy, don't send it out for translation because tracking edits across multiple languages can be very confusing. If you put a website up and you know you're going to make changes to it, because that's the advantage of a website, what you want to do is just make a note or track the changes somewhere when you've compiled enough of them, like say you've got 10 or say you do it every quarter or you know whatever your strategy supports, then you send it over your translator to, to a, do a bunch of them at one time. So you're doing it in clumps, not one-offing it on the fly, which is hard to keep track of. Cultural adaptation. This is where the human translator is really important. Um, I'm running short on time, so I'm going to give this story quickly. Um, their tagline there was make more happen. They wanted to take the more out and then they wanted to put other things in. One of them was make refrigerator art happen. Raise your hand if you know what refrigerator art is. Okay, my Spanish speakers don't know what refrigerator art is and neither did our French speakers. Because refrigerator art is a very American thing. Let's take our kids' art, let's put it on the refrigerator and its gallery. In a lot of countries, and in France in particular, uh, the translator came back and said, that's not a thing. A refrigerator is for keeping food cold. We don't hang our kids' art on that. So we went back to Staples and we said, hey, this isn't going to work. So that's what a good human translator is going to do for you that machine translation can't do. Different ways to, to, to do quality. Um, proofread is you can, if you're a school or even the museum could have one good translator uh, do it. You don't have to pay the extra for editing, which would be a second translator equally qualified reading it. Um, a review, you don't have to have internal people, but you can if uh, you want to. And back translation is usually when you need to CYA, like the, uh, you know, if you're doing clinical trials and you need to prove to the FDA that that's what's done. We very, very rarely rec uh, recommend back translation. 
Then you get into the SEO, and there's a lot to consider there. Don't clone the pages because that, um, that can signal that it's duplicate copy. Um, machine translation can tell Google, like if you're using the Google plugin, I've heard that that can also say duplicate copy, so you're not going to get the advantage from it. Um, there's different ways to handle the language versus the country tags, um, and I can get into more detail with anybody that, that cares about that. Drop down, this is important because um, if you use, say you use a href line tag, and I go in and I, um, it picks up that I want my Spanish language tag, um, or country, let me use country. So you're in Spain and you open it and it says, ah, oh, this person's, uh, you know, I'm in, in, in Spain and I want it. Well, say I don't speak Spanish and I want to read it in English. If you don't have a drop down menu there, then the person can't choose the language that they want. So even if you're coding it for a lang or a country tag, make sure you still keep the drop down menu. Um, and then a glossary, I think this is the one that I want to call out most, is if you have words that are very particular, you know, your SEO terms or industry specific terms, um, these are the ones you want to develop a glossary so you make sure you're consistent in using. Costs. Um, costs can vary by a lot of things. Um, industry standard historically has been the cost per word. I'm seeing a lot of games going on now where um, companies will give a low cost per word, but then they'll, they'll build in a big project management fee, a big review fee, a big hidden overhead fee. Um, and, then, but, and it's really confusing because I've taken some competitive quotes and I've looked at them, and by the time we figured it out with the, with the word count and brought it back, it would have been the old-fashioned word cost, which was about twice as much as what they were saying on there. So um, be very careful of that. And these are the things that you want to look for to make sure uh, that the price includes it. So, and this is why also, I put this testimonial up here, that uh, whoever you end up working with, make sure that they're really talking to you at the beginning of the project to set the strategy. So if you don't know something or you're going down the wrong path, you've talked it out at the beginning rather than at the end when you pay, you know, pay for a lot more or something you didn't want. Larger companies have always looked, not, have looked at translations of cost of doing business. It's a cost center. But the smart ones are really figuring out how to track the ROI so you can realize that it's an investment in getting a, a return rather than just a cost to the company. So see, these are some of the different ways that you might be able to measure. Um, and then you're not looking at the, you know, finance coming in and trying to X out the budget. Or if you're talking to clients, talking to them why it would be beneficial for them to do other languages. Resources, if you want to follow up on this, I gave you some funny stories at the beginning. Um, we do a lot of these because we think that they're very good for education, so if you're interested in our book about them or getting on our distribution list. Uh, we do have a WordPress translation guide if you're interested, let me know. And um, if anybody is interested in a free multilingual marketing assessment, we can certainly set that up with you and the company. All right, so I think there is one or two questions left. Did I get everybody's question? Or is there still something outstanding? Or any new questions? Hi, I work at UMass Boston, though I'm not representing them today. Um, and uh, we have a very uh, large international constituency of students there. Um, and and my, my question is a strategic question um, about um, it, uh, something that happened when I was first starting there working in asking for a translation for maybe the commencement site for the school so that parents could, you know, right. So we ended up using the cheapest, you know, AI Google translator for the commencement site. We vetted it a few times with a bunch of people, but, you know, first of all, getting usability of students to actually read it and vet whether that translation worked was a problem, and of course we're a public uh, university, so we're limited means. The, the question I have is regarding that site and regarding 
of our mo mobile app. Um, I had suggested that for our commencement for the mobile app that we have it translated or figure out how to translate for the students. And I was arguing with one of the other uh, co-workers there, another designer, she said, oh, you know, parents, the parents aren't going to even bother to look at that or they're not going to have the app to begin with. So they're not going to need, we're not going to bother to need to translate. Whereas I think, I thought that was a mistake. My question is strategically, do you look at the usability aspect of it, or do, are you just at that point where you're already assuming that this that this needs to be translated, and therefore, you know, you move on from there, or do you have a uh, vetted uh, strategy for whether to to decide whether it merits even having the translation done? That is a perfect free MMA. You know, you don't have to have the strategy to explore it. I mean, at our agency or a lot of the other agencies, if you get a good person on the phone, they can talk you through it. Because there's so many complexities to that. So let's talk afterwards because we are out of time. Exactly. And I would love to explore that more with you because that's, that's a bigger, that's a huge question. Um, okay, so I'll be up here for a couple minutes and then I'll be out at the happy table if anybody has questions or wants to give me your information and I can send you the, um, the presentation. Thank you.